So I'm Judith Stribling and I'm uh, associated with the Friends of the Nanticoke River. Um, we have been together for 30 years working on our um, goals of conserving the Nanticoke throughout its extent, Maryland and Delaware. And I'm really happy to be here to share with you some of the issues that we're finding now. And I'm not getting this to respond. Come on. Okay. For some reason, my keyboard is not working. Hey, Judith. Yeah. Some, there you go. Do you see the little scrolls there on the bottom? Yeah. I did. Okay. Uh, yeah. Use yeah. that. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I, I haven't done this before, so any help you can provide. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So, so this is our mission, and and again, the friends of the Nanticoke are are paying attention to a number of issues that we feel represent threats to the Nanticoke. So, hopefully, I'll be able to um, give you a sense of what some of those are. Um, and I haven't included obviously everything that's a threat to the Nanticoke, but the highlight, the the five. Uh, highlights I'm going to cover are the disposal of poultry processing waste, um, the proposal for an enormous salmon production facility um, on the Marshy Oak Creek, um, invasive species, the presence of, of looming sprawl development and, and clear cutting of stream and wetland buffers, and then I'll say a little bit about sea level rise. If you look at what comprises a live chicken and you subtract everything uh, there from what is packaged and sent out to consumers, what you have left is the blood, the guts, the feathers, the beaks, things that can't be directly sold for food. This is called offal. And it is still a valuable product. It still contains some things that are usable. So the uh, uh, poultry industry has uh, developed a mechanism for processing this called rendering. And this material is then sent, the, all of this uh, food processing waste is sent to a rendering plant. Um, the largest one in our region, the most important one is Valley Proteins, which is uh, found in Lakewood, Maryland. And this process, this rendering process involves taking away the usable portions of this offal, you know, the, the proteins, the fats, the things that, that can provide nutrition and uh, converting that into a component of pet food. Um, the, uh, the wastewater from that process is then treated to take out some of the remaining nutrients and fats and solids by this process called dissolved air flotation. We refer to it as DAF, and we refer to the product as DAF waste or DAF material. If you've ever seen a protein skimmer in an aquarium, you know the kind of process where air bubbles actually strip out fats and, and, and proteins. And this material is skimmed off, collected, and trucked away from valley proteins to be used as a soil amendment. It is very, very high in nutrients. The remaining wastewater gets settled out into lagoons and discharged into a tributary of the tiny Transquaking River. And if you look at this overhead, you can see the um, location of valley proteins on the Transquaking River. Unfortunately, that wastewater is still quite high in nutrients. So Valley Proteins, which has been there since the 50s, but really ramped up its production in about 2013 maybe, um, has um, continued to, has continually contributed vast quantities of nutrients to the transquaking through its wastewater. There have been over 20 years of repeated violations of its uh, discharge permit. It has to, it has to, um, it's supposed to follow a uh, TMDL permit, a total maximum daily load discharge permit. Um, it's continually in violation of that permit. Not, not only that, but for 14 years, it was operating on an expired permit. It had requested an expansion and that request was not addressed for 14 years. Whether the plant actually expanded over those 14 years is, in, is sort of in a matter of speculation. <clears throat> but in the most recent two year period, the, the plant itself reported 40 violations of that uh, wastewater, that, that National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NIPTES permit. Um, so these data don't really adequately describe the impact of this plant on 
the Transquaking River and the downstream waterways. However, <clears throat> when it was established, the Transquaking River was pristine, beautiful, and home to a vast diversity of fish and other wildlife. It flows into a, a beautiful pond called Higgins Mill Pond. People went there to bass fish. Um, and then finally, it, it ends up in Fishing Bay. <clears throat> Higgins Mill Pond is now the site of very frequent microcystis algal blooms due to the high nutrient um, loading. Um, even a couple of dogs have died from swimming there. This is a very toxic algae. Uh, the nutrient content is so high in the transquaking that um, the Nanako Creek Watchers re regularly find excessive nitrogen and phosphorus, and it typically receives an F or a D on the um, Nanako uh, Creek Watchers report card that in the uh, fishing bay system as a whole. So this is a huge contrib contributor to the pollution of fishing bay, which is tidally connected to the Nanakoke, and we consider that part of our whole system. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what the, uh, what the uh, outcome of that was later on. The material that doesn't get dumped into the water is that DAF material that is skimmed off is trucked in vast quantities to be, uh, as I said, used as a soil amendment. And it is now being stored primarily in this large storage tank in Wicomico County near Hebron, Maryland, that was constructed, I think, in the 2000s. Um, the construction of this tank has been a contentious issue since the permit was first granted uh, very quickly by the county's planning and zoning department. And um, the, the neighbors have complained vigorously about the appalling odors that are generated by this material as it is being loaded into and offloaded from this tank and then also being spread on the land. Um, not only does it have an appalling odor, but it also, because of its incredibly high nutrient content, it represents a threat to the, to the watershed. Um, if this tank were to rupture, there is no containment facility for it. Not only that, but the potential for overflow exists because it is an open tanked facility. So all of things, these things lead us to be very concerned about the storage of this material. After the material has been uh, delivered to the tank, it is then offloaded again by trucks, which carry it to individual farmers who apply it to the land through an in injection process. One of the problems with this is that unlike fertilizer, the regulation of the amounts of this material going onto the land is much less well-defined. And there is considerable evidence that the um, limits to the application of this material are not being followed, that the calibration of the injectors is set to the highest volume possible, and that basically what we have here is a situation of waste disposal, not nutrient application. I, one thing I forgot to mention is the trucks going into and out of this DAF storage facility um, are traveling on a very small roadway, which is not, I think it's within 500, half a mile, I believe, of Rawastico Creek, a major tributary of the Manicoke River. And these trucks have been known to not only run off the road, but to actually overturn. So the risk of spill from the trucks is another one. Next on the list of threats to Nanakoke is the proposal by a company called Aquacon, which is uh, planning has proposed to build a very large salmon production facility in Federalsburg, Maryland on the Marshy Hope Creek. Marshy Hope is one of the two big creeks that forms the Nanakoke River and is also um, a very pristine waterway right now. This facility would cover 27 acres, so hence it would be one of the largest buildings in the state of Maryland. The stormwater runoff would amount to about 750 gallons for every inch of rainfall. There's not a very clear uh, proposal for how this is going to be managed. In addition, the discharges from this, the holding tanks themselves would uh, enter Marshy Hope Creek, representing up to 15% of its total flow. And that water, 
Most of the time would be fresh water where Marshy Oak Creek is brackish. At times it would actually be high salinity when the fish are finished off, the salinity is raised. There's a number of issues with waste disposal from this plant and also water um, disposal that lead us to believe that this is a very, very poor location for such a facility. While salmon production has the potential to provide high quality protein with fairly little impact, that has not been proven. And there are no contingency plans put forth by the company for catastrophic events, despite the fact that salmon production facilities around the world experience huge die-offs with the loss of and the need for disposal of enormous numbers of fish bodies. Um, the Marshy Hope Creek, the most important thing about it is, in, in, with respect to this plant, is that it is home to the endangered Atlantic sturgeon, and this population has been documented to be reproducing, and the vulnerability of that population to any modification of salinity, nutrient levels, or other effluents is just too great a risk, we believe, for this plant to be sited there. I know that there is an enormous amount of lobbying going on right now, however, to make sure that this happens. Next on our list is invasive species. When plants or animals enter an area that it, in which they are not native, they may simply find a benign niche, but often they are without predators or without herbivores or without any real competition and they're able to out, out compete and displace the native uh, species there. Plant species that are a real threat to the nanocoque include a lot of these woody vines that tend to kill and strangle trees. These include English ivy, porcelain berry, phragmites is another non, not a woody species that, that is, has an impact on, on the, uh, the riparian zone. Wisteria, this is a picture right here of a wisteria population over in, on the Wicomico River that has killed a seven acre forest of pine trees. And these trees literally strangle the trees. They grow around them and cut off their nutrient supply and their light. And as the tree dies, and falls over, the wisteria just climbs up that tree and over to the next living tree and continues the process. Um, by displacing the native species, these, these plants have a way of, of removing the entire buffer, have the potential to remove the entire buffer that is in place to prevent stormwater and nutrient runoff and also provides very essential wildlife habitat. And invasive species have been shown to really greatly reduce the species diversity of the areas that they invade. We are paying attention as well, not just to plants, but to animal species. And one of the ones that I am most worried about right now is the emerald ash borer. As a wetland ecologist, I always um, love teaching my students the four colors of wetland trees, black gum, green ash, red maple, and white Atlantic white cedar. And the green ash is one of the most beautiful trees, easily, easily identified because it has compound leaves. These are dying in droves now due to the infestation of the emerald ash borer. Um, and in addition, we have spotted lanternfly, we have gypsy moths, you know, a number of, of uh, pest species that uh, represent a threat. And there's a new oak disease, a pathogen that appears to be taking its toll uh, in, in other areas and possibly moving this way as well. But the, the green ash is a very important, com important component of our riparian forests on the Nanacoke, and its loss would be tremendous. Okay, what did I just do? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, another invasive species that has a tendency to remove uh, butlers, buffers, excuse me, is the uh, human population. And uh, uh, the rapid increase in development with, with increasing property values, increasing uh, demand for homes means that the uh, riparian zones, the buffer areas, the wetlands and the waterways along the Nanacoke are severely threatened. Um, many times developers clear cut the entire region adjacent to these water resources 
at times even making incursions into the, the buffer or into the wetlands themselves. Maryland has a little better track record, the Maryland portion of, of, the, uh, of the river. Delaware is pretty dismal in its handling of, of natural land cover in the uh, riparian zone, that's the region along the river. This is from the Delaware River Basin, it's just comparing other states in that basin to Delaware, and you can see that Delaware has uh, done a pretty poor job of preserving natural land cover. Um, Sussex County has um, a 50-foot buffer requirement in its zoning code for uh, between new development and wetlands or wa other water resources. This isn't a bad requirement, the fact is, but the problem is that it's often not enforced. So in 2018, that was recognized to the degree that the county decided to um, move towards developing a new buffer ordinance and included that uh, objective in its comprehensive plan. In 2019, the county established a buffer work group. And this buffer work group consisted of a very diverse group of, of people who were um, representing agriculture, um, uh, wetland experts, environmental groups, builders and developers. The Center for Inland Bays was a key player in this group. They did a, a tremendous job in hammering out a plan that everybody felt pretty good about, a very uh, contentious issue that they were able to uh, come to some really good agreement among this diverse group of people. Then in 2020, that work group effort was suspended. And in 2021, the county rolled out its new buffer ordinance, which contained a number of provisions that seriously weakened the work group's plan, set the potential up for um, clear cutting for us in the buffer ahead of development and gave developers the option of trading buffers, um, replanting uh, grasses instead of trees. Measures like that that, that appear to have seriously weaken <coughs> this proposal. <clears throat> Right now, the Sussex County Council is in the process of, of holding public hearings, and there will be another follow-up hearing this coming Tuesday on the 22nd. So if you're interested in that um, and you have any questions, you can certainly let me know, or, or I think Lisa's aware of the, the measures as well. Here's a picture of a, of a pretty good 100-foot buffer. That's actually the, the distance that's being proposed, which is, which is good. Um, around a development and you can see how that buffer is positioned in such a way that it can do a good job of containing sediment and nutrient runoff from this otherwise completely peeled landscape of this development. Buffers become also very important in the face of sea level rise and sea level rise is probably one of the great, is certainly one of the greatest threats to um, our region right now. I think just yesterday, the, the latest report came out and every report of, of projected impacts that we see is dramatically worse than the previous one. Um, but typically what happens in natural landscapes is that riparian zones have their own way of, of dealing with, with sea level rise <laughs> if it's not excessive and if they have the opportunity. So as sea level rises through inundation, marsh is lost but that lost marsh is replaced by marsh that migrates upland, replacing in its turn forested upland. This is a natural process that can allow the land to basically be protected from the effects of erosion and, and uh, displacement by sea level. You're all familiar probably with what we call ghost forests. Here's an example of one of those upland forests that's been replaced by marsh vegetation. <coughs> The, the increasing presence of these is one of the biggest pieces of evidence that we actually are experiencing sea level rise, but that process is a fairly natural process. So where there are marshes that are extensive, like in much of the Nanticoke River, the, the risk of sea level rise is not as great. These marshes will migrate inland, they'll replace trees, and everything will kind of remain fairly um, protected. You can see a, a, a close up here of the upper Nanticoke with extensive marshes and what's inland of those marshes in the Maryland region is often natural landscapes, agricultural or, or forested landscapes because of the critical area law which protects the 100 foot buffer. Um, 
So this is again, a landscape that may do okay. The only problem is that if you look closely, you see the buffer is fairly tiny. There isn't much of a buffer between the farmed cleared land and the marsh, but nevertheless, there is the potential for retreat of that wetland and it will retreat over the farmland and the farmland will give way to marsh. <coughs> Not the case in, in much of the Delaware portion where building has been allowed to happen right down to the water's edge. These areas are going to be extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. And this regular flooding has to be the source of considerable contamination of the water as, as waters flood these areas and then recede carrying materials with them that are pulled off of the landscape. So those are my five threats. And um, I, I debated how to organize this and thought, well, I'll just save the, the good news for last because that's kind of the way I like to think about things. So where do we stand and what, what bright spots do we have um, respecting these issues to, to kind of focus on here? Well, as far as valley proteins go, uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment and the Attorney General Frosch have just filed a complaint in the circuit court in Dorchester County against valley proteins, seeking corrective action and also civil penalties. So we're looking at that closely, watching closely because MD does not have a super strong track record when it comes to following through on enforcement. But I think the uh, flag has been raised that this is a serious problem that has to be addressed. Uh, there are some issues with where the material is going now because the plant isn't actually shut down. It's still producing and it's still delivering DAF waste and it's still delivering wastewater. Some of that wastewater is going to Herlock where it will enter the Marshy Hope, which is another threat to that creek. So uh, the problem is huge and, and needs some attention. One other bright spot though is that a process called anaerobic digestion, which is planned for the Seaford area right now, may actually make um, this this waste disposal that Valley Proteins is currently doing obsolete. Um, the, the rendering process could produce pet food material, and then the rest of the waste can effectively go into, or at least the DAF waste can effectively go to uh, anaerobic digestion, which can convert this, this poultry waste, either raw or, or DAF waste, into what's basically a dry odorless pathogen free product that is easily shipped off the shore. And it also produces methane, which can replace fracked gas and provide uh, an alternative to fossil fuels. There's a considerable amount of disagreement about whether this is a good thing, but we, we believe that it has overall a very net positive for waste disposal and also for greenhouse gas production. Um, for Invasive species, there is a partnership for regional invasive species management that's been established. And I just uh, learned that there is new legislation proposed in Maryland to improve the regulation of invasive species that will require uh, listing of these species and, and prohibit um, sales in um, uh, greenhouses and, and you know, landscape garden centers. Uh, I have to look at it closely because I haven't really read it myself, but I think the, the, plant, the prospects are good. Delaware already uh, has some very excellent um, invasive species measures in place for plants, uh, at, at least. Um, so people are beginning to recognize that this is a tremendous threat to both ecosystems and economies. There is growing support for real buffer requirements in Delaware, but it's an uphill battle. So that just remains to be watched. Um, and then as far as sea level rise goes, the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge was recently expanded to form what's called the Chesapeake Marshlands National Wildlife Refuge Complex. And that complex is really uh, focusing on expanding resiliency to sea level rise. So both states have proposed protecting a considerable area along the river. Here's some illustrations. I hope you can see this, but on the left side, you can see current and proposed protected areas on the Nanticoke, really extensive. And then on the right, actual parcels that have been uh, added to that marshlands complex and will represent regions where um, marsh migration will be um, allowed to happen naturally. And that is all I have. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Our next presenter is Chuck Stentz with Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And he's going to be talking about Atlantic sturgeon research in the Nanticoke. And I know we had a ton of people asking about this. So Chuck, I'll hand it off to you so you can <laughs> let us know how the sturgeon are doing. All right. So 
Today, I'll talk about the ongoing Atlantic sturgeon research in the Nanticoke River and how we're using acoustic telemetry and other new exciting techniques to inform management. Um, this research is a collaboration between, of course, Maryland DNR, uh, Delaware DENREC, University of Maryland, Chesapeake Biological Lab, uh, University of Delaware, Delaware State University, and NOAA Fisheries, the Office of Habitat Conservation, are also known as the Chesapeake Bay Office. Um, if you can see my uh, cursor on the screen here, a short presenter's note, we put on all of our presentations, pictures, everything we do, that all activities were conducted under our NIMPS permit number 20314. So having said that, moving to our next slide, come on. So we have to go back to 2013, specifically uh, Maryland DNR's Angler's Log website. Um, we have a, a couple guys that they like fishing on many of the rivers in Maryland, and they like to fish for carp and catfish. Well, we found this little post on, on the Angler's Log, a uh, fellow's name's Bill. They had a sturgeon actually jump into their boat. Uh, broke his rod holder, knocked his coffee cup into the water. It took us about a month of trying to contact him before we were able to, to get in contact with him. And he's been a wealth of information for us, um, you know, telling us where they see the sturgeon jumping and all that. And um, uh, presenter's note number two, these activities were not conducted under our NIMPS permit. So now what do we do? We know there's sturgeon there. With the help of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we deployed two acoustic receivers in the Marshy Hope. Uh, we use stainless steel hardware, zinc plated copper crimps, and cheap square tubing, uh, as you can see on the left side of the screen, for the anchors. Um, we also use hydraulic hose at the attachment points to minimize any abrasion, the mooring lines, the piers that we use, or U.S. Coast Guard assets. Uh, you can see on the three different types of moorings we use here, these are, everybody has seen these, they're called gym buoys. We attach our receiver right to the gym buoy and they hang there with no problem. We also use several piers, uh, residents on the Marshy Hope that allow us to put the, the receivers on their piers. And then, as I said, the Coast Guard assets, uh, we have a license with U.S. Coast Guard to hang receivers on several of our, um, several of their assets. Let's see. So these are the Maryland deployments through the years from 2014 through 2021. Um, the Chop Tank River at the top, we, we currently have two receivers there. Um, at the bottom, the Pocomoke River, we have three receivers there. The Nanticoke River, we have nine receivers up to and including the, the state line with Delaware. And we have also have 24 receivers from the confluence of the Nanticoke the whole way up to about three quarters of a mile past the city of Federalsburg. Um, not to leave Delaware out, um, the Delaware folks have 24 receivers from, from the state line the whole way up, including Broad Creek and also Deep Creek. Um, so now that we have the rivers wired for sound, we need to tag some sturgeon. So we started gill netting in 2013 using seven, eight, and nine inch stretch mesh, stretch mesh gill nets. We didn't have a lot of luck using those. So we changed to change the size of our nets to 10 inch and 12 inch nets. And we also changed the direction of deployments from parallel to the current to perpendicular or from bank to bank. After these changes, we started catching sturgeon. Uh, normally we catch one per net. Uh, if we were lucky, we'd catch two in a day. 
Um, but there were a few times that we would catch multiple fish in, in one net. Uh, we found that we caught more fish in overcast or rainy days and also close to slack tide. It gets quite busy on overcast days, and especially rainy days. So now that we got, now that we catch the fish, now what do we do? So on the six pictures here, we tail tie the sturgeon to the boat before we even try to remove them from the, from the net. Um, we've had instances in the past where the sturgeon would get out of the net before we had a good hold on it. So we tail tie them to the boat. And then we also use what's called a hoop net to control the fish as we're bringing it in. It looks like a big sausage uh, stuffing um, case. And then once we get them onto the boat, we put them in a, uh, it's about an eight and a half foot long tank. And we use compressed oxygen to keep them keep the oxygen saturated. And we also use electronarcosis once we start to do the surgery instead of using chemicals. Um, the benefit of using the uh, electronarcosis is when you turn the, the electricity off, they immediately come back to, to you know, awareness. It takes anywhere between 15 and 20 minutes for them to respond if they're under the, the chemical anesthesia. So once we have them under electronarcosis, we insert the acoustic transmitter and suture them back up. And in the picture on the bottom left, you can actually see two of the sturgeon eggs that came out while I was doing the surgery. Um, then after we're done with the surgery, we take a DNA sample and we weigh the fish. And um, you can tell on the caudal fin at the back here where we take the DNA sample. You really don't need much. So we take the DNA sample, weigh them. They get measured in the tank while they're still in the water. And then they're ready for release, as you can see on the bottom right. Um, and like I said, when they're under electronarcosis, as soon as you put them back in the water, they swim away. All right. So we've caught 35 fish from 2014 through 2021. Um, of those 35 fish, seven of them were females, and they averaged roughly 137 pounds. And uh, 28 males averaged about 67 pounds. Um, the two fish that I showcase are, uh, the female is Masandi. Uh, we caught her in 2017. She weighed 181 pounds. And our buddy Igor, we caught him way back in 2014 and he weighs 92, 92 pounds. So these are some of the detections through the years. Uh, there's, there, it's a little bit of fun data. It's basically a 10,000 foot view of what we're doing. But um, the one thing to notice here is that Igor is up top here. Igor's a rock star. He returns every single year to the Nanticoke. Um, a lot of our males do return to the Nanticoke every year. And there are some that once we tag them, they never come back. Um, our other uh, female, Masandi here, we tagged her in 2017, and she hasn't been back yet. However, that doesn't mean that, that she's dead. Um, we do get, we do get uh, detections on receivers from as far away as Long Island, New York, um, and off the, the coast at the uh, Bureau of Energy Management's array. I think it's uh, 42 miles out to sea. And she's been as far south as Garden City, South Carolina. And all those detections have been from 2017 through 2019. Okay. Another objective covered by the NOAA Chesapeake Bay Office was to conduct a riverbed habitat mapping. And they did that in Broad Creek, Marshy Hope Creek, and Maryland's portion of the Nanticoke River. They went down as far as uh, Vienna. Um, and with that, they use side scan sonar, multi-beam and single beam sonar. And these maps are two examples of habitat polygons in the Marshy Hope Creek. Um, both of these areas are where we catch the majority of our sturgeon, especially the, the map on the right 
Um, we call this the pump house site and also uh, Great Cabin. These are about four and a half miles below Federalsburg. Okay. And in this slide here, we just wanted to, what, what they do is to validate the bathymetry and the side scan sonar data, they'll take individual ponar grabs for the different areas where they have some question. And as you can see on the slide, um, the gravelly bottom is on the upper left. Uh, the muddy ponar grab is on the right, and then the bottom is sand, and also pebbles with sand bottom are on the left-hand side. So in late, in late August in 2015, University of Maryland deployed egg samplers in two gravel bottom locations. Uh, it's pretty much the same area that we're catching our, our adults. Uh, samplers are checked for eggs about every three to four days, and uh, no eggs were found during this period. Um, this is basically the equivalent to finding a needle in a field full of haystacks. It's, it's definitely tough work. So in late August 2017, University of Maryland deployed a VEMCO positioning system. And again, they're in the same area that we've uh, caught our, our adult sturgeon. Um, this area contains a concentration of small gravel bars, as you can see here on the blue colored polygons. Um, again, this is where we catch the majority of our fish. Um, so deploying this VPS array allows for fine scale estimates, less than two meters of a tag sturgeon's location and movement within this target area. Um, we use 15 receivers and synchro transmitters uh, to create the array. And then as you can see with all the little dots on here, you can tell where the sturgeon are hanging out. Um, individual sturgeon spent on average 45% of the time within this region over gravel mix substrate, which would be in blue uh, on the right and left side here. Uh, another, another objective was in 2019, University of Maryland deployed a fixed station, they're called Adaptive Resolution Imaging Sonar System, or ARIS for short. Um, they deployed this in the lower marshy hope to intercept the false spawning run of sturgeon. So from the telemetry data of tagged fish crossing the station, we can one, estimate detection probability of the error system and to determine the frequency of multiple counts of the error system. During the 14 day deployment, more than 280 hours of footage were recorded rep representing almost 600 gigabytes of data. In addition to this stationary unit, a mobile array was used to estimate the probability of transition by sturgeon across the survey during the survey. Um, we discovered, unfortunately, that in depths of less than three meters or roughly nine feet, um, it curtailed the effectiveness of the heiress. They just couldn't pick the, the fish up as easily. Um, sturgeon were noted in real time, but the passing vessel would, uh, it would elicit a flight response. So you really couldn't get real good pictures of them you know, as the boat was moving. Uh, 35 hours of camera footage was collected and that rep represented over 220 mega or gigabytes of data. Our juvenile trail survey is conducted in the early spring when water temperatures are just above seven degrees Celsius. I'd love to have some nice pictures here, but it's usually way too cold for us to to take pictures while we're working in that. And uh, on, on the Nanticoke River, we use a 25 foot semi balloon otter trawl. Um, each station we tow for 10 minutes and there are 12 stations that we, um, that we sample on the Nanticoke and then Marshy Hope Creek, we have to pare it down a little bit. Uh, we use a 16 foot otter trawl um, and we have five stations there, there as well. Um, we haven't caught any Atlantic sturgeon juveniles yet, but there are tons of blue cats. So 
So Delaware State University and University of Delaware conducted a side scan sonar survey in 20 and 21. Uh, the surveys were conducted from the confluence of the Nanakook River the whole way up to Federalsburg, which is roughly, roughly 27 kilometers. Um, each transect took them between two and a half and three hours. Um, simultaneously with the side scan sonar, they also used a mobile tracking receiver to record the acoustic signals from our tagged fish. Uh, based on the targets identified along um, the track survey, um, the average number of adult sturgeon from Marshy Hope to the map from Federalsburg to the mouth uh, averaged 10.9 sturgeon. Uh, maximum number of 14 were recorded on September 18th, and a minimum number of nine were recorded on September 4th. So that kind of shows that. Uh, later in September, more fish showed up in, in the Marshy Hope. So using our acoustic telemetry, we can shed a little bit of light on, on spawning migration timing, the staging areas, and the suspected spawning areas. Uh, the Nanakook River exhibits a fall spawning population. Uh, that's kind of unusual as most migratory fish are springtime spawners like striped bass. Um, they usually do the majority of their spawning in April, where we found that um, the population in the, in the Nanakook River comes into the river in June, July, and they seem to, to like to hang out right at Chapter Point, which is downstream. Uh, depicted here in blue. Um, these detections were taken over the 2016 and 2017 season. And as you can see, there's a lot more detections at Chapter Point than there was the whole way up to Riverton. And and as you can see in this slide, the areas upstream in the Marshy Hope Creek, it's highlighted in yellow here on the on the map are the areas of suspected spawning habitat. Uh, uh, additionally, the data that we have generated over the years um, has also been used to designate Maryland's portion of the Nanakoke River and Marshy Hope Creek as critical habitat for Atlantic sturgeon. Overall, there's a lot of research ongoing in the Nanakoke River, and uh, I just tried to give you the 10,000 Foot picture. And that's it. If anybody has any questions? Well, great. Um, I'll hand it over to actually our next presenter, who also was our last person with a question, Beth Wasden. Um, she's going to be giving a presentation on septic focus focused water quality monitoring in the Nanacoke. So, Beth. All right. Yeah, it's always hard following up <laughs> after sturgeon, especially when we are talking targeting pollution now. So um, this presentation, as Lisa said, is going to um, cover some of the septic centric sampling um, that we've conducted in the Nanticoke. And unfortunately, it's all been in the Delaware portion of the watershed at this point. Um, although we are hoping to do some sampling in Maryland soon. I am Beth Wasden. I am the Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator at Nanticoke Watershed Alliance. And before, um, oops, sorry about that. Before we get into the actual um, program and what we do, thought it would be helpful to just take a look at the number of septics, and again, this is just in the Delaware portion of the watershed. Um, Delaware actually has much better records um, in terms of septics than Maryland. So this information is, is readily available. Um, I removed all of the duplicates so that each tax, tax parcel only had one entry um, and then I clipped that layer down so that it's 
just showing septics that are within the Nanticoke River watershed in the state of Delaware. And we still had um, almost 13,000 entries um, in terms of, of septic permits of some sort. And keep in mind, some of these septic systems, they range from, if, if you look at the data um, in the actual table, it can range from a cesspool um, to a mound or a gravity system and many things in between. Some of these permits are also, um, you know, the system is abandoned, that sort of thing. But for the purposes of, of just looking at this layer, you can pretty much follow the contours of the Nanticoke River watershed in the state of Delaware by just looking at the septic systems. The brighter yellow color with the larger um, circles, those are the sampling sites. And you can see that they're all in Delaware, as I said before, except for there is a little cluster of sites. Those are all along the, the Rewastico Creek. Um, and we use those as, as just kind of a, like a little pilot um, sites when we were first starting the program. So it was a good way to, to get um, our feet wet, so to speak. And of course, the Nanticoke River watershed boundary, you can mostly see Maryland because none of the data or very little of the data is going into Maryland. Um, but that is the extent of the Nanticoke River watershed. So what are we doing with our septic focus sampling? First of all, we are looking for the presence of optical brighteners in the waterways. And we use a fluorometer called the Aquafluor that is especially configured to detect optical brighteners. What are optical brighteners? Well, they make your whites whiter. So they are present in almost every laundry detergent out there. So by being able to detect optical brighteners in a waterway, it tells us, hey, there is either some sort of gray water output or there is some sort of leaky septic system. By also testing for E. coli, and we use Coliscan Easy Gel, which is just a tier one method of measuring E. coli. So it's good for educational purposes. And really, that's the purpose of this program. We are, are, are basically just trying to gauge how much of a problem septic pollution potentially could be. So by also testing for E. coli, if we're seeing a lot of um, bacteria or high bacteria levels in those waterways where we're also seeing higher values of optical brighteners, then that is really reinforcing, hey, it looks like it, it could really be a potential septic issue here and not so much a gray water output. And of course, septic, leaching septics can increase um, total nitrogen in particular. And we know from our Nanico Creek Watchers program that total nitrogen, especially in the upper segments of our waterways, including our more, our more pristine areas, such as the Marshy Hope Creek and the Delaware Headwaters, total nitrogen tends to be higher in those areas than in the lower section of um, the watershed. In addition to those septic central um, parameters, we also are taking some standard Creek Watchers field data. So we're following the, the same protocol for that um, as we do in our Creek Watchers program. So we're collecting dissolved oxygen, the water temperature, salinity, if it's a tidal site. Most of these sites are non-tidal. So for those sites, we measure conductivity. We also also collect pH, water clarity, and total water depth measurements. Last year, uh, between January and July, we tested at 57 different sites. Um, it did get more challenging. And, and you can see in this picture, this is um, Horsey Pond. I believe it was, it was actually July 4th. 
Um, and it was, um, unfortunately, this is very typical in what you expect Horsey Pond to look like in the summer. Um, obviously, when you have a lot of algae, it makes it more difficult to test. Um, and then also you can expect certain parameters to be uh, tuned in to those algal blooms and to reflect algal blooms. So I highly recommend concluding the sampling certainly no later than early June. It really depends on each year as far as how soon things warm up, how much rainfall we've had, but certainly by early June. And this year when we sample, we really want um, and plan to conclude all of our septic related sampling by the end of May. Um, but algal blooms, dry conditions and excessive vegetation just do not um, combine to make good sampling conditions for this program. Also, the fluorometer has temperature limitations and for it to be used effectively in the field, the temperature needs to range between 7.2 and 35 degrees Celsius, which is 45 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So if this is something that you are looking to do, it's really similar to any other water quality program. You're going to need to draft a protocol and you're going to need to be prepared to update it as you get experience and as you notice different things. Certainly last year was, was a big learning experience. Um, I believe at this point our protocol is pretty well fine-tuned, but it certainly took experience actually going out in the field using the instrument um, to make sure that the protocol was doing everything that it needed to do so that we were getting the very best data. Um, also make sure that you are training and retraining your staff. For this program, unlike our Creek Watchers program, it was all staff. So it was either um, me or Sydney or one of our AmeriCorps members. And so um, last year it was Max who was going out a lot and Teddy has been assisting since they've been on board. Another thing is the fluorometer for optical brighteners. Unfortunately, there's no calibration standard that you can purchase. Um, if you're sampling for a variety of other things, such as conductivity, um, salinity, there's, you know, there's a great um, calibration solution standards out there that you can just purchase and you know that they're good to go and what they are supposed to be um, in terms of numbers. There's nothing like that for optical brightener, so you have to make your own calibration standards. Optical brighteners are sensitive to light and to temperature, so you need to make sure that those are mixed and stored in amber bottles. Um, so we have a policy where we make fresh calibration standards each month, and we do a test on all of the standards following calibration to make sure that they sync up. If they don't, then we create fresh calibration standards and do it all again. It also takes some time to create those calibration standards because you are mixing powder tide with deionized water. And of course you're mixing it up and you know what your washing machine looks like when it's agitating. So it takes a long time for those uh, bubbles and foam to settle down. So it's really recommended that you take a couple of days to do that because you're gonna get better results. You wanna make sure that you're preparing before each sampling event. You want to make sure you have more sites than you could possibly hit lined up. And you want to, of course, hit them in a logical, uh, in terms of spatial, um, uh, conditions, you want to make sure that you're hitting those in a logical um, framework. You want to, again, minimize the number of people who are sampling so that you have consistency in following the protocol. And also, of course, you want to make sure that you're partnering your monitors in pairs. So it's always good to have a buddy system. First of all, it makes it faster and also it's great for safety. So how did we select sites? At first, it was really, 
exclusively based on foot accessibility. Hey, there's a road crossing here. Let's check it out. Is it accessible? Okay, we're going to sample here. Some of the sampling occurred, um, especially early on, where there really weren't a lot of residential um, housing around. It was very rural, um, a lot of farm fields, and again, not a lot of housing. And true to form, we did not um, get a lot of, we didn't get pings at those types of sites as far as having high optical brighteners. So after seeing that, we decided to really, hey, we have some data on more rural areas, but let's make sure that we're actually focusing the sample at mixed sites or sites that had a lot of residences around where they actually could have some faulty septic systems. Um, we did, again, if you think back to the slide a couple of slides ago, we did have some issues at potential sites after May. Um, waterways were too dry. There was too much vegetation. Um, the, the algal mats were just too thick, things like that. So again, this year we'll be wrapping up by the end of May. Um, last year when we sampled, we did do up to 10 sites per event. One important thing to keep in mind is that you have a six hour holding time for bacteria. Um, and even though we're doing tier one E. coli testing, we still want to adhere to that best practice of only holding that sample for six hours before it gets processed and incubated. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, again, all of our sites were in Delaware, except for those test run sites along the Rewastico in Maryland, which were done in January. So now we're looking at a map that's showing the results. And basically what we're looking at are um, circles. So the bigger the circle, the higher the E. coli count. And the redder the circle, the higher the optical brightener readings were. So what we're looking for are big red circles. Big purple circles don't count. Little red circles are things I think we should follow up on um, because we, we did have some readings that I did question as I, I looked at them. I think they're worth going and retesting. But you can see that there's a cluster of um, potential um, faulty septics uh, in the Greenwood area and west of Greenwood. And then also in some areas, um, there's some areas west of Seaford and also east of Seaford and kind of like in between Seaford and Georgetown. You can see those were Wastico Creek sites um, scored very uh, minimally with optical brighteners. And also being that it was January, E. coli counts um, were very, very low as well. So no, uh, not a lot of residences around those sites as well. So something to keep in mind. But you can see there are a lot of purples and a lot of smaller circles. So just zooming in on those Greenwood area sites, you can see that um, there are five sites here that, it, you know, where it's a potential septic issue at these sites. So there are some areas of opportunity that have arisen from this. So after getting that year of experience, um, ponds with um, clustered houses, and there are a number in the area, but in particular, Records Pond and Horsey Pond, which are both in Laurel, and also Williams Pond in Seaford. Those sites always have an abundance of algal blooms um, during the summer months, really beginning in late May and, and continuing. I think um, I saw algae in those ponds until October and November this year. Um, so basically, once it starts, it just keeps turning. And if we get a heavy rainfall, then it clears it out for a little short period of time, and then it returns shortly thereafter. Um, in addition, potentially some waterways not well represented in, in initial sampling efforts. Um, 
So there are some sites that are in areas that um, may be included in future wastewater uh, treatment plant extensions. So um, if there's some sampling sites that are near those areas, those would be good places to follow up on. Maryland sites, again, we only have the data for those were Wastico sites. So big question marks with um, the portion of the watershed in the state of Maryland. And then again, doing some follow-up testing at the sites that had the highest optical brightener and E. coli readings. And of course we would need funding for this, but doing some DNA source tracking, for example, because doing that source tracking, that tells us absolutely if the bacteria is coming from a, a human source. So that's the one way to be absolutely positive, but that's very, very expensive testing. So that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? So we'll hand it off to our next speaker, Victoria Spice. Um, she's gonna be talking about invasive species, which um, Judith kind of touched upon as one of the big threats in the region. So Victoria, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome, thanks. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, perfect. Okay, awesome. So um, again, my name is Victoria Spice. I'm the Invasive Species Coordinator over at the Lower Shore Land Trust. I've been with the Lower Shore Land Trust on and off um, for almost 10 years um, as a volunteer intern, all the rules, all the contracts, and I, uh, I just love it over there. Um, so over the next 15 minutes, I guess I'm gonna just do a quick background and history of um, invasive species and how we've tried to take it from a, a regional perspective, um, why do we care? What is the PRISM, um, the Lower Eastern Shore Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management? What are we high-fiving about? Um, what are our accomplishments and what you can do? So, um, okay. so this effort started actually back in 2016 um, with a conversation at Wacomico County's Natural Resource Conservation Advisory Committee, NRCAC. Um, it was kind of um, started off by our state forester at the time who was getting all of these um, requests on private lands, on municipal lands um, for invasive species, but he was could only work within his realm and realized that there really is no regional invasive species management effort on the lower shore. So funding was requested um, from the county council at the time to support an invasive species management um, coordinator and to get that kind of off the ground. But unfortunately, the idea was like a little bit before its time. So after a couple years of letting it simmer, uh, LSLT and NRCAC held an interest meeting with representatives from all the counties, um, NGOs, Maryland Department, of, Maryland Department of Transportation, State Highway Administration, Tri-County Council, um, and Maryland Extension Office, and with the I, and the idea at the time was well received. Um, so they felt optimistic, went back to the council, asked for some funding to do a little bit of restoration and um, hire an interim coordinator to start the restoration efforts at the two county parks. And so they were secured funding for that. So in fall, um, that person started and restoration began and in, uh, winter of 2019, they identified the Chesapeake Bay Trust Outreach and Restoration Grant to get things moving. So they were successful in leveraging the county's current financial commitment to receive additional grant funding through CBT. And then I was hired in April of 2020 to be the Amisa Species Coordinator and start the restoration at Pen Pemberton um, Historical Park and Leonard's Mill Park, both in Salisbury. So I was also tasked with starting the PRISM that we'll get into a little bit later. So Judith, you did a really great job um, introducing invasive species. So I'm not gonna spend too much time. Um, I'm gonna kind of whiz through the next few slides, but I love to start my presentations off with this picture and analogy because I think, that, think it sums up invasive species so perfectly. Like one minute, 
laying on the beach, soaking up the sand. And the next minute you look up and there's a tsunami coming at you. Um, this is because most people have no idea what is happening when a base of species emerge in a landscape until it's too late um, to make a run for it. So native plants are replaced by non-native invaders, hence, um, so they take over. Most were brought here on purpose with good intent, but no idea of the risks. Here in their non-native habitat, invasive species have no natural predators to keep them in check. Um, wildlife or insects to eat them or kind of like keep them at bay. So invasive vines in particular are a huge concern um, because they can overwhelm native trees and tear them down as they are a lot heavier than the native species. So the next slides are just a few of the species we are concerned about and how they kind of affect our day to day without even realizing it. So invasive species are a public safety concern, um, particularly vines like wisteria to the left and porcelain to the right. They take over, they strangle, pull down and girdle trees, and the native vegetation gets shaded out and dies. Um, so one of Wacomico County's greatest concerns at Pemberton Park, where we are currently doing our restoration, was from a safety and liability standpoint, because wisteria had been choking out native vegetation and creating these widow makers, or you know, the dead standing trees that on a windy day potentially could endanger the visitors. Um, they are liability to our assets, like our parks and public work facilities and buildings. So overgrown and unruly invasives could also pose as visibility threat to roadsides and access roads. So to the left, we have Japanese honeysuckle and to the right is, um, I think it's golden bamboo. They take over banks, creating sterile environments with zero native vegetation. And sometimes depending on the species, zero bank stabilization. So Phragmites to the left and Japanese knotweed to the right can have that effect creating flooding issues, especially in our low-lying communities. And lastly, invasive species destroy opportunities for our farmers and our ag and timber industries. So Palmer amaranth to the left is an invasive species that's just devastating our agricultural community. Farmers are being forced to walk away from their crops when Palmer gets in because it's glyphosate and many other places or and many other classes of herbicide resistant. Um, within the timber industry, calorie repair kind of poses as the biggest threat. It establishes itself really quickly and dominates the understory, can destroy 70 to 100 year stands effortlessly. So we started the Lower Eastern Shore Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, the PRISM, to help focus our regional efforts. So what is it? Why is it necessary and what do we do? It's a cooperative of state, county, federal, and NGO partners dedicated to reducing the negative impacts of invasive species on the lower four counties of the Eastern Shore. And currently, we are being supported by the Chesapeake Bay Trust in Wakamaku County at the time. So um, why, why a PRISM? Um, first off, there is no Lower Eastern Shore Management Program, so, and we've already seen that there is a need so prior to 2008, most counties throughout the state had a weed man throughout the state of Maryland had a weed management program funding through funded through the MDA that would work with state highway administration and private landowners to control noxious weeds and invasive species along right, or highways and private lands. So unfortunately, that effort has been reduced to only about I want to say 12 to 16 counties in Maryland. But we'll get more into that a, li a little on the next slide when we talk a little bit about the history. Um, so the PRISM, why a PRISM? Because of shared outreach. Um, so share trainings, information, brochures, fact sheets, anything to provide information to anybody. So the PRISM provides a vehicle for increasing public awareness um, through enlisting support from HOAs, municipalities, private landowners, and shared implementation. So we hope to serve as a clearinghouse for shared implementation successes, what to do, what not to do, what kind of standards, uh, protocols, so that way we can get more done with less money. And lastly, because we will be working among our partners who share the same goals as us, we are more likely to obtain grant funding from third parties. Um, for instance, the Blue Ridge Prism in um, the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, that's another prism that um, 
and they identified they identified um, a dozen or so landowners that needed funding for invasive species control and was able to submit an application to receive over nine hundred thousand dollars in equip monies. So another example is the Capital Region Prism in DC last year was awarded over two hundred thousand dollars from the National Environmental Education Foundation to um, do some really cool stuff. They created a strike team and hired a bunch of seasonal employees to eradicate some um, invasive species within their, their park system. So again, as a partnership, we are more eligible to go after the big monies to fund our efforts. Um, so prior to 2008, 20 of the 23 counties had cost share weed management programs funded through MDA. Like I said, only um, I want to say a dozen or so do. Um, and then just if we're looking at all of the different ways to manage invasive species, so that's through, you know, some of the state agencies. DNR has their own invasive species just for their parks and lands. Then there are there are cost share programs available for landowners through NRCS and other programs, but it's such a small percentage of landowners that are receiving that funding. And when it comes to doing outreach and education, I mean, those offices are so understaffed and it's not, it's not a cohesive um, effort. Um, and then there's a Maryland Department of Ag. They do some invasive species management through, um, well, they have noxious weeds, which are regulated by law. Um, so if any landowner is, um, is, if any landowner has any of the eight species listed under the noxious weed, the Maryland weed law, then they are regulated and required to remove them. Um, but then there's also tier one species, which are species that cannot be sold in um, nurseries and, or cannot be sold commercially. And then there's tier two species, which is, they have about 11 species on that list, which um, if they are for sale at a nursery, they have to display this um, tier two sign, so plant with caution. And then there was just a new bill that was proposed that would add species to tier one, increase um, some outreach for native plants, um, and then increase priority status for native plants in procurement process and, and, and projects through the state. Um, but that, that bill is still getting reviewed by, um, I believe it's still getting reviewed, so it's not quite, it's not quite there yet. However, Delaware, I did do a little bit of research before this presentation. Um, in Delaware, a new, a new law passed in March of last year, so I believe it'll be effective this year, um, prohibiting the sale of 37 invasive species, including some really um, popular species among landscapers and household favorites like um, wisteria, um, English ivy was on the list, calorie pear was on the list, and any person that violates this law, so anybody that's called selling or buying these, these species is subject to a civil penalty uh, or a fine of 50 to $500. So that's a really great stride that Delaware has made to um, combat this issue. Um, so the PRISM, what do we do uh, regionally? So we provide seasonal workshops, um, outreach education materials, and we'll kind of get them to the, the next slide kind of goes over some of that with some of our accomplishments. We coordinate with all of our partners to share resources, manpower, leverage funding for treatments. Um, we work with our county and state partners to implement some of these restoration projects. Right now we're working at Pemberton, which is the, the picture to the top. Uh, the top picture here is um, some of the wisteria before we got our hands on it. And some of the, the bottom picture is actually the runners that are still along the trails um, near, the, near the site. Um, so we're working at um, Pemberton, Leonard's Mill Park, and um, the city of Salisbury. And then we've also done some invasive species stuff at Cypress Park and Pocomoke and a couple other projects. But um, and then we also provide because we are a land trust and we have that, that um, audience, we provide referrals to landowners about upcoming grant and funding opportunities and share our resources with them. And then we also recruit and train citizens volunteers to map our invasive species, which I'll get into a little bit later. So our accomplishments in spring of 2021, we hosted a three-part training for Wacomico County Park staff to get educated on invasive species by learning you know, basic identification, top species to look for, how to correctly manage, and um, we compiled a bunch of resources for them. So we've adapted this training and we've presented it to a couple nonprofits. So I'm sorry if 
Some of these slides sound familiar to you and you've already heard a little bit of this presentation, but um, I, love, I love doing this stuff. Um, and then we're gearing up for our third year at um, Pemberton and Leonard's Mill. It's about 13 and a half acres of uh, invasive species that we're restoring. We've hosted volunteer work days with groups like the Algonquin um, Ultras Running Group down here. Um, and one evening we tackled the vines that were choking out some of the hardwoods at the, at the Pemberton site. So in this picture up here, you can see these brown, um, the browning of the vines on a couple of the, um, on, on the vines. This was like a couple days after the event. So within our PRISM network, we were able to identify contractors and foresters that donated close to $30,000 in time and services to the effort. So we're able to, again, because we're a PRISM, we're a network, we can we share mutual goals. We have friends that are passionate about this stuff too. We're really able to get in there and make a, a, big, um, a big splash, I guess. <laughs> um, and then we've designed a bunch of cool um, resources, including a 100 plus page uh, comprehensive toolkit on invasive species. And then we've compiled a contractor list for folks looking to enlist professional help for invasive species. Over the holidays, we were awarded the um, CBT um, Outreach and Restoration Grant to restore Salisbury City's park. And lastly, um, and this is I think one of our biggest wins is we were able to be successful with the help of MDA and NRCAC partners to reinstate the Wakanaka County Weed Control Program, which hasn't been up and running for almost 10 years. So I would definitely consider that um, a presentation. Uh, I'm sorry. Hey. Success. I'm thinking, how much, how much more time do I have in my presentation? Um, so the next few slides were really focused on. Um, so the last few slides are focused on what the prism has done on a regional level, and then the next few slides are like when I do my outreach and education. These are some of the things that we can do on um, on our own backyards because we know, after all, like we know firsthand that all it takes is one wisteria vine to jump an HOA and suddenly we have 12 acres growing at Pemberton. So it's, it's really important that we educate every single person about what we can do. So these are the top 10 species to be concerned about. Like I said, we um, uh, do training on these. Um, I'm running out of time, so I can't. And then these, these slides here are, um, these are pulled from our toolkit. These are our top 10 species. And, um, and these are the ones that you notice we do have Tree of Heaven as a double doozy because of the spotted lantern fly. And then we have a couple shrubs and then we have a lot of vines. Vines are really causing havoc. And this is what the toolkit looks like. This is um, the QR code to get it up and running. And then most importantly, we need to report our invasive species because it creates a baseline as to why invasive species management is needed and how it travels. Um, we're able to use that data for funding, um, for mapping efforts. You can do this by, we've, we've chosen to do all of our hosting through EdMaps, um, which is a really great, um, it's pretty much like crowdsourcing for um, citizen science. So anybody with a smartphone or computer can use it. So I highly recommend folks visit that website. Um, and then thirdly, stop buying a basis. This study is actually really interesting. They took a look at eight, about 1,300 plants identified, and 61% of them were still for sale in the United States. So when you go out to these commercial garden centers, you know, avoid language that's naturalized, a vigorous blower or grower, touted for good erosion control, attracts birds with showy berries, or like those um, wildflower kits that you don't know really what's inside of it. It's just a random seed blend. <laughs> And then, we, of course, we, we like uh, my, my daughter Sunny here in this picture is saying, when you remove invasives, be sure to plant the soil with natives. Um, so I always try to do outreach on, you know, where, where can you buy these natives locally and who can you work with locally to ensure that you're removing invasive species effectively and you're putting the right species in the ground. And that's it. We'll um, head over to our next person, Bobby Gorski. Um, he is going to be talking about vegetative environmental buffers, and he is actually the new coordinator over there for vegetative buffers at the Delmarva Chicken Association. How are you doing, hey, Bobby? How are you guys doing? Good. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Um, what, um, actually, let me go back a little bit. Uh, 
right. Just to give everybody a little um, preview, I guess, of myself, um, the new ag conservation um, specialist here at the um, Delmarva Chicken Association. And I will be replacing the retired Jim Passwaters. Um, he pushed the vegetative buffers as the VEB coordinator, and they kind of expanded his position when I come on board to help poultry growers look at other things on their farms, um, especially plant getting grasses planted in front of the fans um, to take that particular matter that's coming out of the fans um, as an air quality um, BMP best management practice. So anyway, we'll jump into the presentation here. Okay, originally the, um, the program was started to plant trees around the poultry farms. Um, and this was considered by some as a harsh environment. Um, in reality, the, the harsh area is is at the fans where that, that air is coming out with the dust and the feathers and the um, particulate matter. Um, so that this was um, taking ground out of production in some cases due to the spacing of the trees away from the houses and some farmers didn't didn't want to lose any land that they were also tilling. Um, so research was done to look at other species, other types of plants that um, will do better in front of the fans to um, absorb the dust. Um, there were also concerns about rodents and attracting more birds to a poultry farm. The, the main reason these buffers were put in place was houses as you see here this poultry farm was probably there originally and then the house was built where you can see the direction of the fans blowing towards the neighbor so that's what we want to try to target um, it started out the program was doing single rows of leland cypresses and um they Leland's tend to blow over, they're shallow rooted, and they tend to get a lot of bagworm issues. And kind of the mentality is if you can't see it, you can't smell it. And that, that does hold a lot of truth with new subdivisions coming in around poultry operations and so forth. This is a picture showing what exactly is coming out of those fans and this arborvitae captured the dust on the, um, on the leaves. But some, some plants just can't take all this dust. So research was done to look at other species. And this just shows the air movement around a poultry farm. Um, the smell usually hovers, you know, at the ground level. And that's where people are. So putting in these buffers, as that air comes out of the fans, it, it goes up upwards and mixes with the regular, the atmospheric air. So here's, here's a couple views of plantings that we're trying to do. Trees in between the houses help um, over time create shade for those houses. And then a double row screen down the, down the side of the house. Okay, so the warm season grasses seem to be the species that can take that, that hot air coming out of the houses along with the dust. And you can see all the, the dust there on the, the grass right there um there there's several species the one that is starting to get a lot of um interest is the giant miscanthus it grows very tall as you can see eight to twelve feet in height 
and it can take the heat and the dust, um, and it's got a pretty long lifespan. And these grasses can be cut down in the wintertime when the, the fans aren't on as much. Uh, but the thing with miscanthus is it, this is a sterile variety, and that's what worries people because of the landscaping miscanthus that, that can spread, um, it can escape. And that's what we don't want. So there's a sterile hybrid that um, is suitable for this, and it, there's no worry of spreading. The miscanthus, while while here, it's it's not approved through the USDA programs like Equip. Switchgrass is the only is is approved for use in the cost share programs through NRCS at USDA. It doesn't grow as tall. Um, it still can withstand the heat and the dust and has approximately the a long lifespan as well. Another species that is approved through USDA is the prairie core grass, and it's just a more bigger bunch, bunch type grass. Um, still not as tall as the miscanthus. This is a, a young planting done in front of the fans, and you can see the, the mulch. This the mulch is put down typically to help retain some moisture for the plants. And it also it it kind of sections off that area of planting. So if if a worker or somebody is doing mowing for the for the poultry grower, they don't they don't get into that planting and mow it down. Here's just another shot. Um, this is planted right down in the swale, the grasses are, um, and it's usually two or three rows. And as you can see, the, the wind, the air coming out of the fans is, is hitting the grasses. We all, they're also planned for the end, fan, end wall fans. And this is around the, the Grass is planted around the edge of the concrete pad that was installed at the end of the poultry house. Just another shot of the center swale plantings, and these are going the looks like the length of the house. Smoke tests were done um, in part with the University of Delaware Extension and with Bud Malone. Um, just to show that air pattern coming out of the um, fans, how it hits the grasses and then goes up. And there's a link here. You can um, go on YouTube and um, see this video in action. And based on this smoke test, it was determined that the grasses can be planted as close to, as 10 feet to the fans and not impact the um, pressure coming out of the um, fans. Um, NRCS, they require a minimum of 20 feet. So it kind of, it, it, it just leaves more area for that um, dust to, to escape coming out of the fans. So here's some reasons to plant the grasses. Um, it's, it's very cost effective. There's cost share available through um, USDA and NRCS, there's grant opportunities through um, here with the um, Del Delmarva Chicken Association. And I know um, Nanticoke Watershed Alliance also has grant funding. Um, virtually maintenance free, you can cut them down in the wintertime months um, and they'll just grow back thicker and wider bunches of grass. Um, weeds can be controlled around them with 2,4-D if needed. Um, here's a shot of a uh, poultry farm. I believe this is down in Maryland. And it shows you, your tree buffers planted around the farm. But then you see in front of the fans, the warm season grasses were planted um, right there. 
Okay, something else that we're starting to push is pollinator plantings around poultry farms and odd areas around the stormwater ponds and even in between the poultry houses just to create that habitat for the pollinators and it cuts down on what the farmer has to mow um, and take care of that way. Um, Pollinators can include anything from bees, wasps, butterflies, moths, birds, bats. They improve the aesthetics of the farm and they're a perennial species. So they'll just keep growing, keep reseeding. And there, there's grant funding available for this. Drawbacks may be um, seed is very expensive, but like I said, there's, there's ways to offset those costs. And the plantings do look rough the first couple of years, but um, give them time and they, they start to flourish. This is a uh, Sussex County farm. Um, there was a planting done between the poultry houses. And what I've been um, talking with Jim Passwaters, if you incorporate some mint species, of flowers into the mix, mint will help um, cut down on your rodents. And as you can see, the, the planting doesn't go all the way up to the house. It's mainly in the um, swelled area right in the middle. Here's another shot of um, that um, pollinator planting. This is around the stormwater pond. As you can see, it adds color. Um, and it, with this height coming up around the stormwater pond, it will also deter your geese from landing in the pond. They like a more open, open water system to um, fetch into. So you may still have ducks that might pop in, but you, it'll cut down on being overrun with uh, resident geese. Okay, any questions? Here's my contact information and um, give me a call if you guys have farms to look at or have any questions on pollinators and vegetative buffers. We'll head out next to um, Brent Jett. He's with um, GMBA Engineering and he's actually gonna be sharing an upcoming project um, that's gonna be going in the ground hopefully in the next couple months. Um, McGrain Street in Seaford, Delaware on Conwell Street. All right. So we've got a little project in uh, Seaford. There's a nice little street. It's got one catch basin at the very head of it that the whole street drains to. It goes directly overboard to the river. Um, no pretreatment, no anything. Um, Here's a overhead shot of the street. About three years ago, Lisa got together with the town and did a little design charrette. This is the, uh, the concept plan that they came up with. You can see they've got little corner bump outs here. They've got a couple of mid block bump outs. You've got a nice little rain garden at the end, a little walkway. Um, I think there was even a little platform to oversee the, the river to to bring people down there uh seaford does do a, like a second friday thing so there's a lot of people that come this way there's a museum down here on this corner there's a little kind of antique store here so there is some traffic in and out of here um that's publicly used so they wanted to improve it a little bit and this one kind of lent itself very very easily for it um, I'm going to go through this real quick. I think we all know what kind of a little, what constitutes a green street, what makes it up, the little mid-block bioretention areas and everything. Um, here's an example of one, and this is kind of what they were envisioning here to some extent, maybe not quite as urban-ish as this one, but you get the idea that you've got the curbs, you've got the access for the drainage, you've got the plants inside. Um, and it brings a little color to some place that 
previously was just completely black top. It reduces the amount of impervious and you're also getting the nutrient reduction out of it as well. So I kind of went through the, the benefits there. This one does have the little scenic river overlook involved with it. Um, there's a little aesthetic value. There's improved uh, property values to it. It's improving the water quality of the Nanticoke. Um, kind of here's the issues that they've got on the street. Everything has to drain all the way down the street. So you're picking up all the grit and grime and uh, fluids that cars drop that are parked there all the way to the end. Here's the existing conditions. You've got concrete sidewalk on this side and then it turns into a, a brick sidewalk over here. There's a brick sidewalk along here in concrete. Um, you can see we're up in like the 20 to 24 range at the top here. So there's a pretty good bluff that overlooks the river. Um, trying to get this storm drain information was kind of interesting because there's about 15 things along that slope, but I think we've got it figured out enough now to, to get it improved with the, uh, with the installation that we've got coming up. If you noticed on the concept plan, they did uh, mid or corner bump outs. They already have bump outs here and they have the sidewalks in place in areas that are already improved like this, it's kind of difficult to do a retrofit to get bioretention in areas like this. In order to get the infrastructure in there for an under drain, you pretty much have to destroy the sidewalk. So you're installing sidewalk back where it was previously. And most of the time it's less than five years old. Most of these are funded by grant sources they don't want to pay for a hardscape, especially if it's fairly new. So um, it, it really doesn't work out that these get installed very often. The other aspect is typically old school, the main street is crowned. Um, these just kind of accept whatever comes to them. So if I were to put a rain garden here, I pretty much would serve this area draining to it, which really isn't a whole lot in the grand scheme of things um, for treatment. So you're gonna go through a lot of effort, have a lot of maintenance to treat maybe one lane that's 12 feet wide, that's maybe 30 feet long. So you can put your money in better places down on the block. So this one drains all the way, from High Street all the way to the end of this catch basin down here. So somewhere in here, there is a catch basin. Um, and this is what it looks like on a rainy day. If you notice in the picture, it's just kind of cloudy. It had stopped raining. And I don't think it had rained for half an hour when I took this picture. And it was just one of those standard rain days. Um, but this is what happens is it all ends up ponding down here. It's one of the smaller catch basins. So it's like a 12 by 18. And you can see it's just completely covered and doesn't work. This is the expanse of what's draining to it. You can see the good news is that this lends itself is you've got parking both sides. It's a quiet residential street on the end. Um, the bones are there because from curb to curb, you've got a great expanse to take out parking, one or two spaces to put in a bioretention area. Um, if you had enough money and enough uh, goodwill with the community to do parking impervious pavers, that's what happened in Cambridge is we were able to go three and a half blocks with pervious pavers along the side. And we had the bones like this that were a good width from curb to curb. But you can see how the drainage, you know, the, the original intent was there, but just an aging street, 
that's one of the issues we have on the shore is a lot of the towns are over 100 years old. They weren't thinking about stormwater management. They weren't thinking about nutrient reduction. They weren't thinking about maintenance in the future. It was just kind of move the water, get it off, let it be what it is. So this is the kind of taking the concept design to the first, um, the first thought process that we took to council to discuss with them. Luckily, we did have some residents show up. Uh, there were a few concerns. We listened to them. We ended up with this one not getting installed or not going forward with the design. Um, which at the end of the day, quite honestly, there's a very large sycamore tree right here. Um, I know as engineers, we put it on the plan, we show it, and they're all kind of the same size. This tree and this tree on an engineering plan are the same size. When you get out in the field, this one's about three times bigger than this one. So the root system of this one definitely would have been in here. Uh, we have a gas line and a water line here that in order to get this down to the end, we would need to either run a separate under drain line or cross the infrastructure over to get to this line and get to the end. So what we ended up with was this rain garden here, which is two spaces long. Um, that way it still is kind of nice and tidy, we still get, I think it's four spaces in here for the museum and we spaced it out so they're normal parallel spaces. We've got the under drain, we tie it over and then we did a brick paver system going down towards the river, which then picks it up here. So the under drain for the brick pavers also doubles as the collection line for the under drain for the first bioretention. So we're getting double use for that infrastructure that we're putting in there. We're keeping it out of the asphalt so we don't have to tear that up. We don't have to put hardscape back and get a grant, uh, a grant tour to pay for that. So that's helpful. Um, putting a new catch basin in down here and a new line over to a junction box. That way we know we've got enough, even if this thing does get clogged up or something happens or we get an inundation rain, we at least got storage in this pipe to get down to that and then get it out to the river. And then we've got all of this in new bioretention to be planted. We've got the under drains, and depending on how they figure out they want to do it, we can actually do head in parking along here. And you're only losing one space here and one space here, when in reality there was a fire hydrant there. You're not really losing the space because if you go head in, you're almost balancing the whole, the whole street. So um, that was one of the selling points for them. With a 40 foot wide street, we can get four spaces at the end. We're taking away two in the first buyer retention and two on this end. So it balances and that, that kind of helps the homeowners down there out that, hey, I'm not really affecting your parking. It's just gonna look different. Here's the brick paver system that we're, we're specking to use. Um, it is an environmentally sensitive material. It's 100% post-industrial recycled, and it's actually made in Maryland. I don't think it's the Nanticoke watershed, but it's made on the Eastern shore of Maryland. Um, so keeping it at home, that's kind of nice. There's a, I call it the egg crate system, but there's a, a stone bedding, the egg crate system, and then the bricks are laid on top. Here's a couple examples of rain gardens, mid block bump outs that were done. Both of these are from Cambridge. Um, I always like to show this little sunflower here. We didn't plant sunflowers in that one, but we got a volunteer and it is a native species. So that's always nice. Um, and at the end of the day, 
this little project, this little bump out, the end piece and the brick sidewalks. We're looking to reduce the total nitrogen by almost five pounds, the total phosphorus by almost one pound and the total solids by 150 pounds a year. So I'll hand it over to our next speaker, which is actually Beth. So Beth Heller uh, with Nanakoke Westside Parish. Okay. So thanks so much for this opportunity. This is amazing. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit about um, uh, a project that just was started uh, on the fly. It's kind of an infant, um, but it's an environmental education um, thing uh, on the lower shore, uh, lower Nanticoke. I'm, I'm a little nervous. You know, I've been listening to all these really good presentations. So um, here we go. So the background, um, this uh, came about because traditionally the Nanticoke West Side um, Missions Committee has offered a three-day vacation Bible school for kids, and um, it just didn't go. Uh, there are very limited programming opportunities for kids. The leadership of the committee and other uh, community folks really um, desired to do something for kids, and then, well, I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of a environmental freak. So um, a little bit about me. I love to, I always love to show this picture because a lot of people don't believe that I actually used to wear a ranger hat. And um, so this is a little bit about me. Um, in my past life, I was uh, with the Maryland Park Service for 10 years. I started out at Assateague and then I ended up at Janes Island State Park in Crisfield. And um, amazing experience. Um, before that, um, in my past life, I was a Girl Scout leader. So having a connection with kids in the out of doors has always been super important to me. Um, I, over the years, have done every possible training that was out there, including, by the way, there was a training that I took from the Alliance, and I'm actually on your website um, in the education screen you can see the back of my head I have a light blue shirt on isn't that exciting so um a sense of place the the lower Nanticoke watershed for me and I grew up um, I'm a come here I grew up in Montgomery County north of DC this is such a, a unique and beautiful and special place um the areas on the west side of Okamago we call it the west side um have got such an incredible tradition of agriculture and aquaculture, lots of watermen. A um, lot of people have been there, their families have been there for generations. And at the same time, we also have a lot of retirees, um, very many well-educated, um, very committed people. Um, interesting place to be. Uh, thank you again, NWA, for the uh, the map. Um, you know, they do say it all flows downstream. So all of these things that I've learned uh, yesterday and today and through reading the websites have really helped inform me and I'm passing it on to the kids. Um, but specifically where I am is focused on um, five communities. I serve three churches, Tyaskin United Methodist, Bivalve United Methodist, and Nanticoke United Methodist, they've all been um, worshiping together as one congregation since 1974. Um, and a shout out, I wanna do a little aside, uh, Judith Stribling, you know, when I went into this being a pastor thing, I prayed that I would end up someplace where there would be a sense of community and there might be a sense of dedication to um, environmental uh, justice and environmental uh, education. And I ended up having Judith in my congregation and she's kind of my partner in, uh, I won't say partner in crime, partner in blessings down at the church. So uh, could I have landed at a better place? I don't think so. But you can see where around, around us, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, getting outdoors, for doing amazing things. Um, and 
what I have found over the years is you can have all the beautiful things, but if you don't get people out to enjoy them, um, they won't be connected to them. So 34.6% of Wacomico County is farmland. And honestly, our west side, we only have 1% of the county's population. When I explain, I'm, I'm a student right now, last semester at Wesley Theological Seminary. Thank you, Jesus. I hear the hallelujah chorus going. Um, when I explain to them where I serve, um, I tell people that this area is gorgeous, but you don't go there unless you intend to go there because it's not on the way to someplace. So a small, small section of the county's population lives down there. I had to throw in the requisite Wendell Berry quote, um, and these are a couple of kids from the west side enjoying the water. So why focus on these kids? As we all know, today's kids, they're, they live a different life from the way that most of us did when we were growing up. I am old enough that I can tell you that I remember my dad who worked for NIH coming home with a K-Pro computer and the keyboard um, flipped down out of this case and the screen was this big and I used to play some kind of crazy little game on it. That's not the kids we have today. Even before COVID hit, kids tended to be more connected to technology than to their surroundings, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in the out of doors. <clears throat> and I love the top picture because you see these kids surrounded by this beautiful place and they're on their electronics. And then we had COVID hit and kids are distance learning and they're even more connected to technology. Not a bad thing, but it needs to be weighed out. 2021 hits last summer. Um, it's our second year of the pandemic. I pushed to have our vacation Bible school be environmental education based. Um, things happen, it's canceled again. So what do we do? We have all of these kids, not all of these kids, there are a few kids, um, with many, many, nothing, nothing is there. That's what I should say. And the fact is that these kids, elementary school kids, travel about 10 to 15 miles each way to and from school. And the high schoolers have to go all the way into Salisbury. They're not, there aren't things close by for them. So do we wait or do we do something? Well, with a bit of a sense of urgency, we developed a program. Now, you know, I know y'all know that anytime you develop a program, well, there are considerations. What's going to be our target age group? Who's going to run it? How, where do we get the money to pay for it? How often and where do we meet? What about safety? And how do we get the word out? Well, the original target age group for our, our program was second to fifth graders. And that's kind of the way the, the breakdown of the, um, the, ed the education goes. But we got requests from kids in that age group. Can we have, we have a relatively mature first grader? Can he participate? We have a sixth grader who really wants to be a part of it. So we now serve first to sixth graders. Our considerations were handled. What about leadership? Well, kind of like what I've heard from several of you other presenters out there, um, there's some passion going on. I have a lot of passion for environmental education. It was just natural for me to take the lead. Yes, I lost my mind the last year of seminary to do this, but hey, I'm gonna do it. But I don't do it by myself. The chairwoman of the Westside Missions Committee, which is, it came from our church, but now it's got representatives from all of the, the churches in our area and people in the community. She handles the registration and she sends out emails and phone calls and things like that. I have a retired teacher who um, actually also now works again for the Wacomica County Schools, <clears throat> but she leads active games. 
out of the blue, we got a community member who, who has a background in environmental education and he wanted to help. And then we have people helping with snacks. This consideration handled. Now, what do we do about funding this? Well, we know that there's a, a decent number of people who live below the poverty line in Wacomago County and even more for children. So what do we do? Well, we're keeping the cost low, but the West Side Missions Committee and my church said, okay, we'll back you up. We'll cover it. Handled. Now, how often do we do it? We've got a lot of busy people. Um, where are we going to do it? Well, to be honest with you, the church where I serve has a fellowship hall uh, called the Christian Center. And we, hey, it's free to use this. So we'll do it there. But we're not going to stay there. The idea is to get them out. That's our base of operations. We meet the first Saturday of the month um, from 4 to 6 p.m. And that time was suggested by a parent. It's after all of the uh, athletic things. It gives them a chance to do anything around the house they want to do. And the fact is that before COVID, we used to host every Saturday or the first Saturday of each month, we used to ho host a community dinner. So this would just roll right into that. Hmm. Considerations handled. What about safety protocols? Now, this is my background with Girl Scouts and with the Park Service. Um, safety protocols. And, and honestly, um, the United Methodist Church has a lot of things about safety where kids are concerned. So masks have been encouraged for indoor gatherings. Every parent has to complete a registration and permission form. It includes contact information. If something happens, how do I get a hold of you? And basic medical information allergies, behavioral issues, things like that, that I know to keep an eye out for. And for privacy's sake, I am the only one who has a chance to see any of that information. And there are at least two adults present at all times. Considerations handled. What about advertising? How do we get the word out? Well, one of the things to know about the lower uh, Nanticoke watershed area is that cell phone coverage is not dependable and um, internet access, as far as I know, has only gotten uh, as far as um, by valve. And even that's not really dependable, but we're gonna start with social media. And then we're gonna go to local bulletin boards. We have, um, we have post offices, we have a, uh, a car gas station repair shop, things like that. We put up notices there. Um, we do have a county community center that's in on the west side. And so they have an after school program. So they got the word out. And then we also have a, a one of those um, signs where you switch the letters around on it. And that was put up. Um, and then, well, thank you, Judith. Um, friends of the Nana Cook event, I was able to bring some flyers there and get the word out that way. So considerations handled. Considerations handled, and the West Side Ex Eco Explorers was born. Or maybe it was that it was hatched. This is the, the logo I came up with that we've been inside too long, and it's true. But even armed with environmental knowledge, we needed partners. I've got a pretty strong background, and I've got Judith on my side but we needed partners. So, hey, there's a lot of people out there who know a lot more than I do and who have been doing this stuff a long time. So let's see if we can get them interested. Uh, this is a huge shout out to Sydney. Sydney was our first presenter. Um, she came and she talked about the Nanticoke watershed with our kids and they loved it. The watershed table is always just a great thing. Um, in December, I did the winter wildlife. Where do winter, where do wildlife go? Um, I use resources from Maryland DNR website. Uh, in February, we did an organic gardening thing. We actually went to Jay Martin's gardens and we walked through the gardens. What does it look like in the winter? Um, and then we had an opportunity to, to spend some time in the greenhouse. 
Uh, next month, um, shout out to our Lower Shore Land Trust folks. Just a reminder, um, <laughs> they're scheduled to come and do a thing on pollinators in March. Um, pretty excited about that. Um, and then I also reached out to the Maryland Department of Energy and they're coming down from Baltimore to do something on sustainable energy for elementary school kids, which I think will be really cool. And then we're gonna talk about tree identification. You get all of this information and you get that from interacting with the environment. Um, one of the things that I believe wholeheartedly is that we need to start people young. We need to st get the kids thirsty and hungry for learning about this environment that they share. Um, and so they connect with it. And then as they grow, they want to protect it. So they've gone through all of these different things um, during the year. So in that in mind, we're ending the year with a service project that the kids are going to design. The kids are going to make an impact on their local environment. Our standard meeting outline, we have a gathering, we have an outdoor active, active game. We then have a presentation, which is based on a theme. And then we have a snack because who doesn't like food? And then we have a craft and the craft has been really fun to tie that in. Um, the first meeting when when Sydney came out and we were talking about the watershed and we talk about what goes into the watershed, we actually did a, a floating paint uh, craft. Then in um, December, when we talked about winter wildlife, we used recycled materials and had the kids create different animals. And then in February, um, we had the kids, uh, because we were talking about organic gardening, they actually did created a windowsill garden herb garden, which was fun. And then at the end of that, clean up announcements and dismissal. I have a rule, the kids make the mess, the kids clean it up, and it's actually been really good. They take responsibility. So moving forward, some future goals. I'd love to see this continue. I'd love to see it eventually expand to middle and high school students on the lower, uh, the west side area, um, and maybe even branch it out a little bit to try to get them to think about their future career opportunities and things like that. I have had com conversations with folks at the Westside Community Center and um, I'd really like to partner with them in moving forward. The other thing is it's super important to me that we actively engage a diverse population. And I'm not talking just about race and ethnicity, but I'd also love to see <clears throat> children um, who may be facing uh, disabilities um, be able to, to be involved. Um, one of the neatest experiences I ever had was with a young girl who was blind and I had her in the woods and she was picking up on sounds and noises that I wasn't able to. And it was just a beautiful experience. And I've had that with, with a child who was autistic and um, just a phenomenal experience. And then the other thing is, well, to be honest, I'm a United Methodist Church pastor, and we have what's called the itinerant um, itinerant process, which means I'm not going to stay there very long, or hopefully, but I, I may very well be moved. So I'd love to recruit new leadership, especially local college students. I, I know with SU not being terribly far away and them having the, and even, um, UMES with the, the agriculture program and the um, Eastern Shore, come on, uh, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. I'd love to have some of those people come and say, you know what, we want to come in and we want to, we want to lead and teach these kids so they get the thirst for the out of doors the way we do. So they'll love it. So they'll care for it. And this is my um, unapo unapologetically um, uh, to, I had to put kids in pictures of the kids in, and you'll see um, it's completely shameless. I admit it, um, but you'll see some pictures of our kids. Lower right hand side, you'll see some of these crazy animals they came up with. Um, you'll see Sydney giving a presentation with the table. You see kids doing their um, their gardening. Um, really, really, really fun and exciting opportunity. And now if anybody's awake, if anybody has any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, I'll hand it over to our next presenter, 
um, our last presenter, Angela Pinder. My name is Angela Pinder um, and I work with Arlington County uh, Schools and my focus is on historical data and mindfulness. Um, and I'm pretty sure you know, as the pandemic, um, we're spending so much more time um, on screens, especially the children, because a lot of our, uh, you know, information that we present to them uh, is are on screen. So I think it's so important uh, to get them out into nature and to connect with uh, the land and the people um, of the land. Uh, my family is from Vienna, Maryland, which is uh, on the Eastern shore and the Nanticoke River um, runs through the land. Uh, my family, we are descendants of uh, enslaved people um, at a place called, on a land called Indian Town at a place called Hansel. So we frequently go uh, to Hansel and connect with the land and the water and we take groups of children to do tours there uh, to just get out into nature. So meditation, according to Wikipedia, meditation is a practice in which an individual uses techniques such as mindfulness or focusing the mind on a particular object through an activity to train attention and awareness uh, to achieve mental clarity, emotional calmness, and a stable state. Uh, so, you know, that's very important. Um, when you're dealing with children every day, we try to get them to center themselves um, in order to focus, in order to calm their emotions, and as well as um, adults. Another practice that we do are libations. And libation is a ritual pouring of a liquid to honor the ancestors. Um, and we often, uh, use the word ashe, which is a term from the Yoruba uh, tradition, which means it is so. So, and uh, in calling ancestors or people who have crossed over previously um, to honor uh, lives that have lived amongst the land. And looking at the Pew, the Pew research and Internet data, I thought these numbers were pretty low, um, but it was saying that average internet usage is seven hours per day for Americans and six and a half hours uh, for British, for the British. Students spend at least one to four hours for homework or research. Um, and video games, social media, they said we're spending about two to three hours. So that's almost like a, eight hour day in front of, you know, the computer or a screen. So in order to uh, extend those numbers, I mean, not extend the numbers, but in order for our health and wellness, it's important to uh, get away from the classroom, um, get away from the computer screens in order to connect with nature. And I have some photos that I would like to share um, from some of my experiences um, with life on the Nanticoke at Hansel. So this is a picture um, last October, 2021, they did a, a, like a commemoration for the enslaved people. It says, in honor of the enslaved people who lived and labored in Hansel, they did this uh, memorial to them. Um, and these are a group of children. They came to visit Hansel, um, connecting with the land, out in nature with the horses. And sometimes the libation and the meditation involves religion. So I put a picture of my uh, great grandmother's church that is in Vienna, Maryland also. I have some children. And that is the end of my slides. I had another video, but I can't pull it up. 
So if you have any questions for me at this time, 